In southern Louisiana, someone is killing the elderly. A psychic 4,000 miles away says she can see the killer. I saw that he was wearing gloves and that he was very anxious, and he was looking for a way to get in. They knew they were getting beaten, and they knew they were going to die. It was horrific, the manner in which he beat and killed human beings. There was a lot of fear going around a community that uh, a lot of people thought they might be the next victim. Can a psychic's paranormal insights help police stop a psychopath before he kills again? Ascension Parish, a small slice of Cajun country deep in southern Louisiana. Within the parish, the small city of Gonzales, a peaceful community of friends and neighbors that prides itself on being the jambalaya capital of the world. It's a place where no one worries about keeping the doors locked at night. But in April of 1997, that peace was shattered. So I was on duty at the time and heard a report over the radio of a possible homicide that occurred within the city of Gonzales. Police are shocked to discover that Lillian Philippe, a 71-year-old widow, has been brutally murdered in her home. It's the first homicide victim in Gonzales in 11 years. It's so beyond what you expect that when a situation like that happens, it just it just goes beyond your range of feelings there. She was scheduled to go on a church bus trip to a casino about an hour and a half drive away. And she was very prompt all the time. If she said she was going to be at 8 o'clock, she was there at 7.45. She did not show up. Gonzales Police Chief Bill Landry is one of the first to arrive at the crime scene. She was on the floor and at the foot of her bed. It's obvious that uh, a knife was used in the attack. There were noticeable stab wounds and some defensive wounds on her hands. There was very little trace evidence that was left at the scene. The coroner on the case, Alfredo Suarez, is unsettled by the brutality of the killing. She sustained multiple uh, stab wounds to the neck area. Both jugular veins were severed by the deep uh, stab wounds to that area. Uh, furthermore, the larynx was uh, partially severed as well as the right lobe of the thyroid gland. In essence, she bled to death, and uh, at the time uh, uh, in that town of Gonzales, uh, this was a horrifying death because the, the, the people in that town are not used to this kind of violent, uh, brutal, uh, bloody death. Miss Leon's death caused a lot of concern because their quiet neighborhoods were now infiltrated with someone who had committed a murder. I mean, there was a lot of fear going around the community that uh, a lot of people thought they might be the next victim. But what the people of Gonzales don't know is even more terrifying. The death of Lillian Philippe is the third murder committed in the past six months along the airline highway a highway that cuts through Ascension Parish, connecting Baton Rouge to New Orleans. Victor Rossi, the first victim, was beaten to death with a baseball bat. The second, Barbara Bourgeois, was stabbed to death. Every time something like that happens, you lose a little bit of your innocence. And yes, it certainly brought, we certainly lost our innocence during this, these events here. Three bodies in six months. Each victim was elderly and attacked in their own home, but police are stuck. But we were running into dead ends. It seemed like every suspect we may have come up with was eliminated. Then Chief Landry receives a telephone call that will alter the course of the investigation. I had received a call from a, a high school classmate of mine, Marsha. Marsha lives in Honolulu, Hawaii. She is the niece of Lillian Philippe. She asks Chief Landry to consult with her friend Rose Cop, a psychic. 
It was suggested to him that I might be able to help. Marsha had some concerns because they didn't know if the possibility of it was just a group of friends, the families that were friends together. They didn't know who was a target. She was concerned for the welfare of her family and just the welfare of Miss Lee and to want to know if we were able to um, detect who had committed the crime. Frustrated with the case, Chief Landry is willing to try anything, even a psychic. I told him that I had worked on cases before and that I might be able to identify to some degree the perpetrator of the crime and might be able to offer some clues or hints um, into the investigation. I asked Chief Landry to send me a photograph of the victim and a small personal item of hers. And the photographs of people actually tell me things. I look into the eyes and it's a, it's a matter that transcends physical reality. Once I see a person's photograph and touch an object that belongs to them, I'm able to um, connect better with the target. But before the photo reaches Hawaii, the killer strikes again, this time a double homicide. Once again, the airline highway, just down the road from the home of Lillian Philippe. Seniors Sam and Luella R. Curry have been bludgeoned to death in their home. Then five days later, another killing. Joan Brock, 55, is beaten to death in her backyard. All signs point to a serial killer stalking the most helpless citizens of Ascension Parish. Although the body count is rising fast, police have very little information. The crime scene reveals nothing. No fingerprints, no DNA. In Honolulu, Rose Cop is already on the case. Like a shaman or a medicine man, Rose enters a trance where she claims to be able to travel to the scene of the crime. A shamanic journey is, is a trance that's induced by repetitive sound. Uh, slowly, by just focusing on the sound of it, your brain waves alter and you feel very light. So I move out of body. Flew over Diamond Head, over the Pacific Ocean. My intention was to go to Miss Lillian's house. I flew over California, Texas. I went to Louisiana. And I ended up standing in the carport. And I turned around and I looked over my right shoulder. And there was so much blood all over the place. What Rose Cop sees is shocking, but is it enough to find Lillian Philippe's killer? It's 1997, and the sleepy southern town of Gonzales, Louisiana, has been rocked by the brutal murder of 71-year-old widow Lillian Philippe. It just goes beyond your range of feeling. Gonzales Police Chief Bill Landry has connected the killing to five others in the area. I mean, there's a lot of fear going around a community that uh, a lot of people thought they might be the next victim. And you had to really uh, keep everybody happy and make sure that they saw patrol cars and they were, saw officers around. And so it was, it was the assurance that we had to give as a law enforcement community, had to give the public to know that they could still be safe in a community that was stricken with a serial murderer. Police have few clues, but Chief Landry has made a connection of the most unusual kind. Rose Cop, a psychic thousands of miles away in Hawaii, claims to be able to see the killer. I saw that he was wearing gloves and his hands were in fists, and so I got the kinesthetic impression that he was very anxious and he was looking for a way to get in. Gloves would explain the lack of fingerprints found at the crime scene. I saw him as a Caucasian male and about five foot nine. And he had brown hair. He was very strong. So he went around to the side of the house. And I saw him move a wrought iron chair from the 
porch area and move that on top of the air conditioning vent and then stand up on it. And then it stopped. My vision stopped. And the first thing she told me was that he placed a, uh, a chair on top of an air conditioned unit and actually climbed onto the uh, roof of the home. Chief Landry is stunned by what Rose tells him. There is no way she could have known about that chair. Entrance uh, was apparently gained through a, a vent through the roof of the house and then ultimately entered the residence through uh, attic stairs. He was like a snake, like a, like an anaconda, or a, those snakes that wrap around you. And he just seized on her and was stabbing her in the neck, in the throat. And there was so much blood all over the place. And uh, I recall her trying to get him off of her, and she couldn't. He was, he was too wiry or and strong. She couldn't get him off of her. And I just saw all the blood all over the pillow and on the bed. Somehow, Rose Cop has seen details of the crime scene known only to police. With the pressure mounting, local authorities team up, creating a joint task force to oversee the investigation. The task force was composed of St. John, the Sheriff's Department, St. James, uh, Ascension Parish Sheriff's Department and the city of Gonzales to try and collect all information. District Attorney Charles Long monitors the task force. The task force thought it wise to consult the FBI Child Abduction and Serial Killer Unit in Quantico, Virginia. After the FBI profiling was done, it was learned that uh, all of the crimes, both in St. John, uh, St. James, and Ascension in the city of Gonzales, were probably done by a single killer. Now, certain he's dealing with a serial killer, Chief Landry once again contacts Rose Cobb. And he asked me if I would go back and see what his motives were, if I could give a more detailed description of him. Rose takes another shamanic journey to the crime scene. I flew over to Louisiana again, and I landed by Miss Lillian's house. And I turned around, and I looked over my right shoulder, and the, the dark-colored sedan was there. I moved inside the car, and I noticed on the floor of the car were gambling slips, lots of papers and bedding slips and things like that. Amazingly, Rose's vision matches with what investigators believe is fueling the killing spree. We thought that robbery was the motive. There was no other reason to consider why someone would prey upon Miss Philippi. We knew from uh, other cases that uh, there was some large amount of money missing, uh, which we felt might be uh, for a gambling habit. Rose also says she sees someone new, the killer's girlfriend. And I saw her in a place serving food. So I realized she was a waitress, so I looked to see her name tag. And I wasn't sure if it was Brandy or Cindy or Candy, but, and then I wanted to know where the restaurant was where she worked. So I looked out the window. I'm invisible all this time, huh? And I looked out the window, and I saw a fairly large building. And I smelled blood. And then suddenly I saw a severed cow's head. And it shocked me so badly that I came back immediately into my body. I was back in my living room. I don't even recall traveling back. It's a bizarre psychic vision that transcends space and time, but it makes sense to Chief Landry. Right off the top of my head, I knew exactly what she was talking about. It was a slaughterhouse. It was a regional slaughterhouse for cattle. And they had a big cow that stood up on top of a sign. The slaughterhouse Rose can see was torn down years ago. I mean, I got officers who didn't know 
that that sign existed at one time or another. Uh, I do remember it because as a kid, I remember the slaughterhouse. And when she said, I see a cow on a sign, uh, it was right off the top of my head. I knew exactly what she was talking about. But it's the psychic's final vision that will blow the case wide open. And then I saw an old woman's hand, and I knew it was an old woman's hand because it was veiny and the skin, the knuckles were wrinkly. And she wrote, River Rat. River Rat, what could it mean? And how is it connected to the case? River Rat is a term that uh, we would use for people who live along the Mississippi River corridor. Or when you get into different sections of South Louisiana, the, the slang, the accent is a little different, and you're able to tell where people are from based on their accent. Chief Landry may know what a river rat is, but what he doesn't know is what it means for the case. That is, until the killer strikes again. There was a couple that was attacked outside our jurisdiction. Around the July 4th weekend, the suspect entered the hall through a utility room window, armed himself with a weapon of opportunity inside the home, shot the female in the facial area, and uh, shot the uh, husband in the chest area. The elderly couple barely survived the attack, but their description of their assailant is what shocks Chief Landry. And they asked Miss Joyce if she had any description of the suspect, and she wrote on a piece of paper, River Rat. Gonzalez police now know they are hunting for a river rat, but can they catch him before he strikes again? There was something going on besides robbery. He woke him up in the middle of the night. They knew they were getting beaten, and they knew they were going to die. A serial killer is on the loose in Ascension Parish, Louisiana. Six elderly victims have been murdered, including 71-year-old Lillian Philippe. Though police believe robbery is the motive, they're disturbed by the viciousness of the attacks. You've got your whole community uh, in fear of who's next. When you go into somebody's house, that's, that's you know, man's house is his castle. And when you're robbing the castle and killing the king and the queen, you got a problem from the sheriff's department's point of view, from the district attorney's point of view, trying to prosecute somebody and bring them to justice and trying to calm the community. So I would say in my years of 15 years as a prosecutor, um, that was some of the worst. You know, we've, we've had some other disputes, but nothing of this magnitude. Gonzalez Police Chief Bill Landry is working on the case alongside psychic Rose Cop. And then I saw an old woman's hand, and she wrote, River Rat. The latest victim has survived the killer's assault. She gives police a physical description of her attacker and also describes him as a river rat, slang for people who live along the Mississippi corridor. Now, using the FBI profile and the victim's description, police create a composite of the suspect and release it to the public. Again, Chief Landry is struck by the accuracy of the psychic's visions. The description Rose had given me was very, very close in the physical features to the composite we ultimately got. Only five days after the composite is released, there's a major break in the case. There was someone who came forward to say, look, I know this guy, he's been spending a lot of money. Uh, in a casino. The witness identifies a resident of Gonzales, a man named Daniel Blank. When you gamble, you have that little card you put in a slot machine, or it tracks not only your earnings, but your losses also. And it tells you how much you spent as to compared to how much you, you've actually won. And they gathered substantial information about, you know, eighty, hundred thousand dollars worth of gambling that he was doing at all of these casinos. And you compare that with what you thought his salary would be for a uh, self-employed uh, mechanic, and it just didn't add up. Then you look at what associations Daniel may have had 
with each victim. And there was some relationship with auto parts, uh, maybe a friend of the family. It, it just, everything just started really falling right toward Daniel Blank. Police go looking for Daniel Blank at his last known address. Task Force decided that, well, we're going to pick him up for questioning. He's got some, you know, we checked on his earnings and his losses at the casino. He's going to have to show us some paperwork as to where this, these finances came from. We began looking for him and learned that he had ultimately just recently had moved to Onalaska, Texas. And so we contacted the authorities in Onalaska and uh, sent our task force to Texas to further the investigation. In Onalaska, Texas, investigators find Daniel Blank and question him about the murders. It was a very long interview. I think it was approximately a 12-hour interview. And when he finally began to confess, of course, they went through each one of the the crimes that were committed in, in detail, like a separate mini interview within the 12 hour interview. And that's when I hit him with it. With what? With the thing, whatever it was I had in my hand. During his interrogation, Daniel Blank admits to all six murders, including that of Lillian Philippe. Police also pick up the mysterious Cindy from Rose's Visions. We discovered Cindy learned that Cindy was actually Daniel Blank's girlfriend. And Cindy was the one Rose saw in the waitress outfit. Um, Cindy worked at a little cafe. Daniel would frequent the cafe because there were video poker machines, gambling machines, and Daniel would, uh, and I feel that's how Rose saw Cindy, but when she saw when she saw Cindy, Daniel was would have been right inside gambling. So she actually saw them both there, but she only read Cindy's name, I think. Police learned Cindy waitresses across the street from the site of the old slaughterhouse, just as Rose had envisioned. His girlfriend, Cindy Bellard, is released after making a deal to cooperate with prosecutors. In his confession, Blank reveals the brutal details of his murder of Lillian Philippe. After using the wrought iron chair to gain access to the home, Daniel Blank attacked the elderly widow with a trophy, then stabbed her to death with a kitchen knife. Daniel Blank, in his confession, indicated he stole approximately $100 from Miss Lillian Philippi's house. My conclusion was there was something going on besides robbery. In the manner in which he beat people, he, he woke them up in the middle of the night, first of all. If you look at it, they knew they were getting beaten, and they knew they were going to die. And for some reason, I feel he wanted them to know that they were going to get beaten to death. Because other than that, you could have just simply went in uh, stole what you wanted and leave out. Or uh, there were more humane ways. If you're going to kill somebody, there are more more humane ways than to beat them with a baseball bat, beat them with a trophy, slice them with a knife, beat them with a bar hook, uh, chop them up, or whatever he was trying to do. Two years after the crime, on September 2nd, 1999, a jury finds Daniel Blank guilty of the first degree murder of Lillian Philippe. He is sentenced to death. The main fact to me was that he was taken off the streets. He was not going to harm anyone else, so that was satisfaction. Despite being over 4,000 miles away in Honolulu, Hawaii, somehow Rose Cop was able to tell investigators in Gonzales, Louisiana, remarkable details that at the time only the killer could have known. He did use a chair to break into Lillian's home. His girlfriend was a waitress named Cindy, and his appearance matches Rose's physical description of the killer. He had a gambling problem, and he was a river rat. For Ascension Parish, 
The conviction of Daniel Blank returns a sense of peace. For the family of Lily and Philippe, it means justice. And for Rose Cop, it means vindication for the psychic powers even she finds inexplicable. I'm surprised, happy, exhilarated, satisfied. I love catching bad guys. I'd say that Rose had everything signed, sealed, and delivered. But I think Rose's uh, journeys did aid us to uh, ultimately get the right guy. Thank you.